Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to the Underground. So this is the intelligence briefing for 12 September 2021, and this is being recorded the day prior on September 11th. So before we jump into the weather, I'll have a quick sort of digression to make right quick, which will make a lot of sense later. Uh, but we're in the process of writing an episode on this exact topic, but I am personally not really convinced that it's going to be a worthwhile effort. Um, and I, but I do think this is something that is worth touching on right now. So here's the short version of it. Um, as our reach here has expanded, a lot of people do not know because they just they just simply don't know or they don't understand the nature of these kinds of briefings. Uh, a lot of people have been kind of treating these briefings like we are journalists, and that's actually not quite right. Actually, within the intelligence community, it's actually a pretty decently strong insult to call an analyst a journalist, right? It's something that, like if you go to a schoolhouse and the you know your intelligence instructor is going to yell at you, they're going to call you a journalist, right, uh, for, for messing something up because that's kind of – it's not a good thing to be, an, to be a journalist if you're trying to be an analyst, right? And this is something that unless you are in that intelligence world, you would not know. So we're, we're not offended by it at all. I just wanted to point it out to give kind of like a little taste of what this world is like. Um, so when it comes to the differences between intelligence and journalism, there are a couple of key distinctions. Uh, for one, intelligence is processed information, right? Information is not intelligence, right? In, intelligence is processed information. So to have an intelligence product, it's going to be comprised of information that is processed by an analyst using a, the intel cycle uh, and a whole host of other analytical techniques, right? We have a whole lot of processes, little tricks of the trade and things like that to make sure that the information is as least biased as possible, to make sure that it's considering all the factors, considering the source veracity, to make sure your sources are reliable, and stuff like that, right? It's a whole process, right? This takes years to learn, even for professional analysts, right? The, the schools for military intelligence analysts are almost a year long, right? Um, and they really should be longer because most intel analysts coming out of the schoolhouses these days uh, know absolutely nothing about the trade. So when it comes to journalism, really journalism should be just the facts, right? The journalism should be, right, this is the ideal world of journalism, is that it should be just the raw details, unprocessed, unfiltered of what's going on, right, with no analysis on it whatsoever. Now, of course, that's not the way the world works. You're not going to find any journalistic agency on the planet anymore that does not put their own analysis or opinion in there and try to disguise that opinion as being a fact. Right. Whereas on the other side of the aisle, intelligence, a good analyst, like the rule of thumb for analysts, right, is that they're going to tell you what they know, what they don't know and what they think. Right. And that distinction is, of course, not always explicitly stated like an analyst is not going if you ask an analyst for their opinion, they're not going to tell you, OK, here's what I know. Here's what I know. Here's what I don't know. And here's what I think about it. Um, it's going to be a mix of, of vocabulary. Right. To get that uh, whole process out. So. Um, that's something to consider, and especially to consider that, again, if journalism includes opinion, like if a journalistic agency is an including opinion in their article, it's not true journalism anymore, right? Even the way that journalistic agencies right now are reporting the raw facts, right? You may read an article and think that it's reporting the raw facts, but they're cherry picking which facts to give you. So even that is not uh, true journalism, right? They need to, to be as impartial as possible, but that's not going to happen. So I just wanted to point out this distinction um, and, and break things down a little bit uh, to hope to kind of clear things up a little bit when it comes to information that we provide in these briefings, right? So this is why we use things like probabilistic language and you know linguistic markers to differentiate between what is known as fact and what we think is going to happen in the future and just stuff like that, right? This gets really complicated, but really I just wanted to, dis to point out the distinction between the two and to kind of show that, hey, this is not just me reading news to you guys, right? This is something a, a little bit more... Uh, a little bit more structured, even though you might not see that structure, right? So let's go ahead and jump into the weather. All right, so weather over the next 12 hours is going to be quite good for really any ISR asset. Um, again, if you're new to the channel and you don't understand why I'm talking about cloud levels and the weather and things like that, we have specific dedicated videos to that. 
Um, and uh, it's probably pretty important to start realizing why this information is important right now. Um, so up along the Canadian border, there's going to be some, some patchy bits of coverage, uh, low-level cloud ceilings, right, as, as one might expect this time of year. But for the most of the United States, it's going to be absolutely perfect weather if there were to be an ISR asset overhead. So again, not saying there are any ISR assets overhead. I'm just saying that this is something that it's good to be uh, good to get in the habit of knowing, right? Also, for the next 18 hours, here's your uh, mid to high level cloud coverage. Again, up by the Canadian border, going to have a cloud ceiling, a, a cloud deck rather, uh, from really low altitude all the way up. Uh, as you can see, the cloud ceilings are going to top out pretty high. So, uh, really bad weather for ISR uh, along the northern border, but for the rest of the country, for the next 18 hours, it's going to be a drone uh, sensor operator's dream. And moving on to NOTAMs. So if you don't know what NOTAMs are, uh, we also have a video on the same exact topic, so make sure to check that out. But the big three that we're tracking today are, of course, all three presidential ones. First one is Biden is going to Long Beach on Monday to check out Newsom's like final rally. Second one is uh, Biden is going to Boise, Idaho for some kind of presidential you know, event. And the third one is, of course, Biden's standard vacation weekend NOTAM. That's from Friday all the way to Sunday. This one pops up pretty much every single weekend uh, because Biden flies home for the weekend almost every single weekend. Just so that if, if you weren't aware of that, that one's a pretty standard one. So. Uh, at this point. So I know that this uh, map looks quite scary right to start with, uh, but I just wanted to highlight that unrest is going to be kind of likely in pretty much all states uh, based on the elephant in the room reporting that we're going to get to in a minute. But the big ones that are going on right now, of course, Portland is still very kinetic when it comes to Antifa slash BLM slash whatever you want to call it now. Um, behavior and uh, protesting slash demonstrating slash rioting in Portland. That's pretty common at this point. Also, New York is still having a bit of resistance when it comes to the medical mandates and things like that. And of course, uh, Phoenix is still uh, still going to be a, a potential location for uh, some civil unrest as we move forward into the election audit uh, results. So, uh, before we get into domestic policy for a minute, I just wanted to touch a little bit on Afghanistan. Um, Afghanistan is still on our radar. Uh, we are still doing what we can. But based on what's happened here in the United States over the past week, uh, we are significantly shifting focus to support the American people here at home right now. Um, this is not pleasant uh, by any means. Uh, there are still thousands of Americans still stuck in Afghanistan with no way out. Right now, the bigger issue that has been sort of thrown in our laps is what the federal regime is doing. So we're having to weigh where we're putting our resources, um, and we're having to determine and, and, and balance and try to figure out what, where we can best help people, right? Um, so we're thinking, well, what's a bigger risk right now? Having thousands of Americans brutally murdered by the Taliban or hundreds of millions of Americans being forced out of a job and not able to buy food for their children? We think at this point that we can do more good here on the home front. Um, so we're stepping up our efforts to data dump our collective knowledge in such a way as to help Americans here at home have capabilities when things get bad. Again, I would like to stress that we're still keeping an eye on Afghanistan. We're not going to let this one go, but there's just nothing we can do right now. Uh, there's very little intelligence picture of the ground. Private People are being arrested for trying to go to Afghanistan to try to help things out. Um, it's just, it, it's become a not good situation. And like I've been pointing out for the past few videos on Afghanistan, every day that goes by, we're just facing diminishing returns. And now our returns are practically nothing. So if another nation besides the United States of America decides to step up their their diplomatic efforts to try to get people back and, and to try to help people across land borders and things like that, we will shift to helping that. But right now, the United States is simply the only per, only entity that can help, and they're not, um, for the most part. So um, a garbage situation all around, but we're going to have to make the decision to kind of shift our focus here to where we can do some good. So let's go ahead and push forward into logistics. So not a lot to add to the map to a specific geographic area, but I did want to speak about the microchip shortage again. 
Um, just me personally, I, I drove around my local area yesterday and every single car lot, uh, about a dozen different car lots uh, from used cars to uh, full dealerships of, of every major auto brand in the United States, every single one had less than a quarter of their lot full. Like so most of the ones that I could see had about five cars in their lot. And that's something I have never seen. I've never personally seen that. I've never been driving around. I wasn't even looking for it. And I just happened to notice, Hey, that that's a, that's a parking lot. Like, Oh, I don't notice it because it's usually full of cars for sale. Well, there's not any cars. There, there are not as many cars for sale now. Uh, actually GM just announced that they're closing five of their plants, five or six, depending on which press release you read. Um, and they're laying off, they're going to be laying off 15% of their workforce, 15 more percent of their workforce. Um, and this is going to result in the majority uh, of GM's North American production capabilities being completely offline due to this chip shortage. They simply cannot make the vehicles, their flagship vehicles anymore because the microchips are just not there. Um, so that is a huge thing to remember. Uh, moving forward into this, you know, whatever we're going through, is that this chip shortage is not getting better. It's getting much, much worse. And also, I wanted to point out the kind of strange shortage. Uh, the FDA has declared a global shortage on their website of estradiol. Uh, I don't know what that, uh, why the reasoning for that is. I know that this drug is used to treat. Um, menopausal symptoms and things like that, but I don't know why the shortage. It might be related to some of the medical stuff going around in the world, but uh, for whatever reason, I just wanted to point it out. It's on the website. You can see the source. The link will be at, at the end of this, as always. Uh, but yeah, kind of an odd one. Uh, we'll try to figure out why this drug is in short supply, but uh, if anybody knows, uh, drop it in the comment section, um, because that's kind of an interesting thing to figure out why this particular drug is in shortage. So moving forward into critical infrastructure concerns. Now this one, uh, this slide is going to be mostly empty because I have another slide uh, that's going to be talking about this in a minute. But really the, the one that isn't related to the big topic for today is Hurricane Ida's aftermath is still impacting things. Uh, petroleum oil lubricant, your classic POL shipments uh, have been affected and repair efforts are going are still underway. Uh, there's still a lot of fallout from that. So just just expect some fallout from that. And then moving into significant governmental actions, the first one I wanted to mention is the military uh, medical procedure mandate. So a lot of people, a lot of soldiers particularly, were trying to figure out, okay, how can I request religious exemptions? Well, um, it, it turns out that a lot of soldiers are finding out that their medical re exemptions are not working. They're not being approved. Um, so a lot of commands have been observed. You can follow on social media, a lot of other, you know, military centric accounts, and, uh, they've got a lot of evidence, uh, regarding commands saying, you know, F your religion, that it doesn't matter, um, all stuff, stuff like that. So that is a huge thing that that's happening in the military. A lot of people were kind of hoping that they would, that the, uh, DOD, would offer them an out, but now it looks like that out is 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 not a, a real con, a real thing. Uh, this this we kind of mentioned in the beginning that hey they're not going to approve these religious exemptions um, because they need total compliance in the military. So uh, we're seeing additional military officers resign their commissions over this. Uh, very quite high ranking uh, officers actually uh, resign their commissions over this. And it's going to be interesting to see what goes forward. But yeah, the military, you're, you, they're not going to get these religious exemptions. It's, pro it's going to be very few and far between the people that actually successfully get the religious exemption to avoid uh, getting this experimental medical procedure. Uh, also, the WHO has uh, issued a PDF, uh, a, a document that outlines their guidelines for creating digital medical passports, right? So what we've been fearing or been uh, uh, concerned about for quite a few months, this digital passport system, this is going to come into fruition quite soon. Uh, right now, it doesn't look like they're, they're, the infrastructure is in place 
But just keep in mind that the WHO is definitely on board with all this totalitarian stuff. Uh, I have the link for the PDF in the sources, uh, so you can download it and take a look at it. it. It's kind of a long thing to go over, but it's pretty it's pretty dystopian. Once you start reading it, you're like, oh my god. Uh, and then thirdly, finally, this is an interesting one. Uh, it looks like news agencies, <laughs> journalistic agencies, are completely forging articles from the ground up now. So you might have seen the reports going around that hospitals were being tr forced to turn away gunshot victims to treat people who have been, who have overdosed on that particular drug that's on your screen right now that I can't read out uh, due, due to YouTube censorship. Um, and it turns out that article was completely false. Uh, actually, the hospital in question that the article talked about had to issue a press statement, which you can read for yourselves right there. Uh, they've not treated any overdoses from this particular medicine, uh, and the entire article was false. The guy they interviewed, Dr. Jason McIlia, uh, is <laughs> they basically they're they're uh, throwing him under the bus because he basically fabricated everything that he said uh, in the news article. So interesting that we're not even uh, news articles and, and news agencies are not even pretending to hide their their bias anymore. So yeah, very interesting to say the least. And moving forward into the impacts from uh, everything that uh, has been announced over the past 24, 48 hours. So everybody is aware that Biden has mandated uh, the jab for every company that has over 100 people uh, working there in the United States. Um, as of, it's really vague because there has not been, as of right now, there has not been an executive order actually signed. So we can't tell you exactly what the, what the mandate, the tyrannical mandate says. However, we do have press statements and releases, uh, which everyone has been circulating online. This is like the story of the year, right? So you can read all that for yourself. But what I wanted to do today is not just share outrage over this, but kind of point out what this means. What are the impacts going to be from this? So buckle up. This is going to be kind of a long one. Uh, this is going to affect much more than what people think. And, um, and in me going down all of these industries that are going to be affected by this, I hope to point out or, or at least show that we're, we're going to have to either the, the United States is either just going to de facto not comply with this or court systems around the country are going to overturn this pretty much immediately because there's no way our society can function like this with the amount of resistance we're seeing. So the image here, the map, shows the number of states which are going to be affected, which is all 50 states. Um, and the yellow striping there, uh, the, the yellow cross-hatching states, are the ones that have declared that they are not complying with Biden's uh, mandates. So let's get into the things to think about as we move forward and why this, it might not seem like a big deal, but by the end of the slide, you should see how this is kind of a very big deal. So the number one thing that is going to be affected is food processing industry, right? The people that actually package up canned goods and put them out, those are companies that are very, very large, and their employees are the kinds of people that are not going to participate in this kind of tyranny. So you're going to see probably a lot of layoffs or a lot of people just outright quit. And also the firearms industry. The firearms industry, particularly smaller companies, right, that are, are not big like national names, but they have, they are very large manufacturers. Uh, they're going to be affected as well because a lot of these places have more than 100 employees. And I can tell you that the kinds of people, again, that work for those companies, if their company says, hey, you've got to get this jab or you're going to get you know, fired, well, guess what? <laughs> they're going to get fired. So um, that's going to impact things as well. And already we're facing a, a – everybody's known about the ammunition shortage and the firearm shortage over the past, what, like year and a half, two years now? Uh, so, yeah, we'll see how that goes. And uh, if companies are going to choose to not comply with this, you know, it's going to be interesting to see. Also, the shipping industry. So everyone's uh, kind of focusing on the uh, Federal Postal Service, right? The USPS, right? Um, that's kind of a, a gray area right now because there's a lot of false information going around about is the USPS exempt? Are they not exempt? Nobody really knows. 
uh, because at first the White House said that they were exempt, and then a press statement was issued saying, oh, no, they're not exempt from this new one, right? They're exempt from the federal employees uh, being mandated, but they're not exempt from this 100-person per company like policy. So it's really confusing right now. However, what is not confusing at all is the other shipping agencies in the United States, like UPS and FedEx and DHL. Those companies obviously have to comply with this, right? Or there it's it applies to them. So man, you know, it's going to be interesting to see, hey, are these employees going to walk away or what's going on with that? Also, POL, petroleum oil lubricants, that entire industry, like, man, find me a, a, an oil roughneck that voted for Joe Biden, right? And find me an oil rough, you know, a roughneck that's going to, <laughs> that's going to accept this mandate and not just walk away, right? Look, I, I know that a lot of people are, are financially desperate right now, like, man, isn't everybody, but man, that, the whole energy sector when it comes to petroleum, oil, and lubricants in this country is is very much run, uh, or at least the bulk of the workers are very conservative, and they're not going to take this tyranny. Um, even it's it's the medical part is kind of irrelevant at that point. Uh, also, the trucking industry, right? 70% of all the food in the United States is transported on trucks, right? And France just highlighted the importance of a national trucking strike. You know, it's so. Um, there you go. It, it could that's this could happen, right? This could be a, a very huge impact, right? It's not like, you know, trucking people who get into trucking are gender studies majors, right? They're they're you know working people, right? Also, public utilities, same vein, right? It's going to be like I doubt that any lineman working in any public utility in the country is a fan of. Uh, Biden's policies. So as a matter of fact, we have direct evidence, you know, whenever he shows up to somewhere like that, people don't like him so much. So again, going to be a huge factor moving forward. Also manufacturing, pretty much anything that gets made is a very large company that's going to be subject to these things. Also agriculture, look at the farming industries. Now you might say, okay, well, a lot of farming in the United States is done by small farmers. Uh, or farming entities that are like contracted out, or if it's just, you know, machinery has made it so that you don't have to have a whole lot of employees for some kinds of crops. Well, look at it this way. You still need a lot of crop, you still need a lot of people for things like, you know, produce, you know, potatoes, things like that. You still need a lot of manual labor. And the people that would be participating in that are not exactly going to uh, take this tyranny lying down, right? Uh, also, retail stores, like, hey, people already, you know, retail, working retail is already a soul-sucking job as is, and if you're going to force people to get this procedure, you know, people are just going to quit, right? I mean, that's what we think, you know? Also, engineering, same thing. Anything that gets made or has to get engineered, we're already seeing uh, a lot of engineering companies, at least this is rumor at this stage, right? We're already seeing a lot of engineering companies, like people who are engineers saying, hey, I'm not I'm not coming into work if you mandate this. So same thing with the auto industry, like the auto unions in this country, man, like sure, the leaderships of these agencies might not be, they might comply with this kind of stuff, but the actual people that work there, mm, I doubt that. Also construction, man, pretty much any manual labor job, right? Anything that requires a human being to, to actually work hard for a living is going to be impacted by this. Same thing with the telecommunications industry, right? The people who not just repair, you know, cell towers and down lines and things like that, but the people who, who sell you cell phones and run call centers and make sure data servers are up and running and things like that. Even the aerospace industry, like Boeing, Lockheed, even NASA, we're, we're seeing a lot of rumors, um, floating around on social media that are about as unconfirmed as you can get. But a lot of people who are allegedly working for NASA are saying that a lot of NASA employees are planning a, a massive walkout and protest and not just like a, a walkout, like they're quitting. And that's going to heavily impact NASA's Artemis mission that's coming up. So I don't know if that's true or not, but you know, again, it's about as unconfirmed as it can get, but Hey, like it's kind of interesting um, that these kind of things are impacting it. Also, the financial world, like, hey, name a financial institution in the United States that has less than 100 people. Like, mm, not going to not gonna happen, right? 
also pharmaceuticals. Like not just we we tend to look at things like the medical industry and we see things like you know nurses dancing on TikTok and then the other medical tyranny stuff. But look at the look at the actual day to day side of the pharmaceutical market. Like people who make Tylenol, right? You know, people who make ibuprofen, stuff like that. Man, it's it's going to it's going to uh, be heavily impacted, right? Because we use so many pharmaceuticals on a day to day basis that man, it's just going to if if people decide to walk away from that job that job field man we're going to be screwed same thing with the entertainment industry now again you're going to have celebrities like celebrity like we have seen like man that's a rabbit hole i really don't want to go down but we've seen most celebrities are extremely politically liberal and are fans of what the biden regime is doing However, I'm not talking about the celebrities. I'm talking about the sound guy, right? The set designers, right? The 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 people that the the behind the scenes that make Hollywood exist, right? Are they going to put up with this tyranny for much longer? I don't know, um, but they're definitely going to be affected by this. Same thing with industrial machining, right? Things that like the behind the scenes of how parts get made for companies, right? Not necessarily the company itself. A company can be tyrannical, right? But but look at the uh look at the 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 parts that actually go into making things like that. Also the chemical industry, like, hey, we already have a chlorine shortage in the United States of America and there's only like one plant uh in the United States that makes chlorine. So at least now, actually I think there are three or four, but that one being offline uh, down south from the hurricane earlier, man, you know, <laughs> we're starting to talk about, hey, how many chemicals do you use on a daily basis? And who, what is the political ideology of those people that make those chemicals? Something to think about for sure. Also things like waste management, right? Like, you know, it, public utilities, again, going to be heavily impacted by this. And these are different industries that are 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 going to be good places for resistance for people. Same thing with the people who make medical devices. Like, think about it this way. The people that make the scalpels, the things, that, the people that make the bandages, that make the gloves, right? The people that make the pacemakers, right? Those companies, right? The doctors can be liberal tyrants and refuse to treat patients. But what about the people that make all of the gear that they need to do so? Mm, interesting, huh? Things like mining, like industrial mineral, like coal mining and other precious metals and... and uh, things that are needed for the tech world, good luck finding a Biden voter in any coal mine in, in America, right? Also the rubber industry, like, man, think about if, if everybody who made tires decided to either quit from their job or get fired because they're not taking this medical procedure, like, mm, I mean, that's going to be a huge thing. Same thing with steel workers, man, we've already seen steel workers get in Biden's face and scream at him for being a tyrant when he was campaigning like, can you imagine the, the sentiments now among the steelworkers unions in this country? Holy cow. If they decided to not make any buildings, <laughs> man, good luck with that. Same thing with rail. Like, like I mentioned, 70% of all food is transported on trucks, but 17% of all the food in the country is transported by train. So now you're talking the super majority, right? 77% of all the food in the United States is either transported by train or truck. You know, hey, <laughs> we're, we're starting to see how much this can impact society, right? Even things like packaging, right? We've already had packaging shortages here in the United States from China, right? So imagine the people that make the wrappers for things, for, for packaging food, for packaging retail items and things like that. It, it's going to be a very widespread, uh, the, the impact is going to be very widespread. So I know that this is kind of a, a very long digression, but I just wanted to point out all the industries that we might not think of being important until they're important. Uh, so this is why uh, I think, this is why I myself am so concerned about this medical mandate thing, because it this has, why, this has more, this is touching more Americans than people realize. A hundred million people, man, that's a little less than a third of the population in the United States. Is, is going to be impacted by this. This is a gigantic leap from all of the other tyranny stuff that Biden has done. Like, this is a huge step that I don't think a lot of people quite realize how significant it is. And since it is such a huge, gigantic leap, um, I don't know how this is going to shake out. 
Uh, I don't know if this is even going to be, this might be one of those things where Biden decrees it, the regime decrees it, and just nobody follows it. Like, this might be one of those mass, you know, civil disobedience things, simply because even if everyone wanted to comply with it, even if every company was tyrannical in the United States, which they're not, they're not. Um, a lot of companies are tyrannical, but a lot of them aren't. Most of the ones that make daily life happen are not really tyrannical. Uh, if those, co- even if those companies, those private industries wanted to be tyrannical, the logistical nightmare of having to manage this, man, I don't know if this is going to be even possible, even if everybody wanted to do it. So while yes, I understand the outrage, I myself had to had to step back from the computer for a second when I saw that drop and uh, just kind of think for a minute because, man, <laughs> this is a big deal. Um, and again, I just really don't know that this is... Uh, well, for one, I have no faith that the courts will actually overturn any of this, right? my I'm not hanging my hat on any court system in the United States ever doing the right thing ever again, or, or even doing the, what the law says, right? Um, at this point, we're talking about violating Nuremberg codes here, you know, which again, doesn't really matter. So um, I, I'm not really hanging my hat again on a judicial uh, court saying that this is going to be unconstitutional. Like they might, the Supreme Court might come back and say, hey, this is, this is like the most unconstitutional thing you've ever done. Um, but I, I don't have any faith that they're going to do that. Uh, what I think is a lot more interesting is trying to figure out like, hey, what what kinds of industries are going to have people either quit or walk out? And most importantly, now here, here's the other kicker, what kind of industries, what kind of markets, what kind of economy is going to spring up because of this, right? We've already seen Australia. We've already seen Australia adopt the mentality of, there's going to be an economy for those who have gotten the, the medical procedure, and there's going to be an economy for those who haven't. Um, Australia is going full-blown that model. And the United States uh, political regime clearly wants to follow Australia's steps in that regard. Uh, however, I'm not so sure they want that. Like, I, I, think they're, I think that this might be a be careful what you wish for, you know, daddy government situation. Because, man, like, look at the political ideologies of the people that make this country run and work, right? It's not like there's a whole lot of gender studies majors out there working at a, an oil pipeline, right? Or working at a shipping terminal or things like that, you know? So I don't know that this is going to be something that's even feasible or possible. So that's why I wanted to kind of talk about this today and get this brief out, this very rough brief out, because I think, yeah, look, I understand the outrage, but I'm also trying to walk it back in my own mind of saying, like, how in the heck are they going to do this? So, yeah, I think that you know, there's an old saying, right, that watch what happens when the people who don't want to be involved get involved. And I think this... This particular benchmark, right, this mandate uh, is going to be the most chance we're ever going to have for seeing something like that happen, right? Because now all of those people who have been like passively resisting or or um, uh, just disagreeing but kind of complying passively, right, all of those people are now being told you're going to get a medical procedure or you're not going to be able to feed your children. And I think that we underestimate people's resistance level when things hit them that close to home, right? The federal government is making the assumption that since people have not risen up yet, uh, and since they hold a monopoly on federal agencies, you know, like there's federal agencies, there's federal agents watching this video right now, right? So since they hold the monopoly on the intelligence community and the ability to arrest anyone for anything, and, you know, there you go, um, they think that people won't resist, and I'm not so sure about that. I will agree that people have not resisted as much as I would have liked, but at the same time, man, there hasn't been anything that has happened so far that has touched so many people on such a personal level. Um, even when it comes to things like you, like you can give them an out, right? Like, like one of the reported parts, we don't know, right, because we haven't seen the actual document yet, but one of the reported things is, oh, okay, well, if you don't want the, the mandatory uh, medical procedure, you can just get tested every week. 
and uh, that, yeah, there you go. You're going to have to be tested every week. Well, I don't think people are going to do that anymore. I think people were doing that in the beginning, but now I think that I really do think that there's going to be a significant backlash from this, and I don't know how it's going to manifest itself. Uh, I don't think I don't think uh, any kind of conflict, like like hard conflict, is going to break out. I might be wrong on that, but I do think that there's going to be, um, uh, you know, dis civil disobedience is going to become cool again uh, for a large portion of the country. Um, now, the, all of that being said, I do want to throw out a few random predictions moving forward for people who are rejecting this medical tyranny, right? Now, I would like to preface that by the usual disclaimer of I don't have a good way to church this up and make it pretty on the slide because right now I'm really just briefing for speed and not for looks. So forgive me if this is kind of a random way of laying things out. Um, also what I'm about to say is probably going to trigger some people and a lot more will disagree. That's, that's perfectly fine. Um, I myself hope that I'm wrong. Um, what I'm about to say is simply my opinion based on my own observations over the past year combined with a decent background knowledge, right? Just, this is just theory at this point. Uh, again, I hope that I'm completely wrong on all of this, but since a lot of people have been asking what's next, right? Like, what are, what are the next things they're going to go for? Uh, here is a short and haphazard answer as to what I and the rest of the staff here who have been brainstorming this think the immediate future will bring. Uh, the first one is interstate travel is going to be restricted. Um, I don't know how this is going to manifest itself, but I've already seen inklings of this. Uh, manifesting itself, and it's already happened on a few uh, last year, right? Um, so I think that this is going to happen probably very, very soon. Uh, I don't know how this is all going to, again, manifest itself, but my guess is that it's going to happen exactly the same as the first time that individual states put up checkpoints on their borders. Um, this will almost certainly be a federal decree slash mandate, whatever you want to call it, but it will probably be left up to the individual states to figure out how to enforce. Uh, this way, conservative states or states that are resisting will resist, but liberal states will happily comply. And this would set the precedent for Berlin Wall style boundaries between states, right? Maybe not a physical wall, like you know, walling off the parts of the United States that are that are jabbed and the unjabbed, right? I I don't think that's going to happen uh, in that way because we can't even build a border. A fence along our own national border, but I do think the mentality of, you know, East Berlin versus West Berlin, it's going to be, you know, red states versus blue states. That's going to be more solidified than it already is when this interstate travel stuff comes to bear. And if I was a tyrant, that's exactly what I would do. You have to cut people's ability to travel between states. That's a key uh, part of what tyrants and dictators do to maintain control in their country. Also, I would be very surprised if the IRS did not uh, institute some kind of special tax. My guess is that it will probably be a flat rate tax for everyone who is part of the resistance, right? Um, and it's probably going to happen pretty soon, right? You're going to have to pay a, a tax in order to be unjabbed, right? This is something that the federal government can easily do, right? Um, when was the last time a, a court overturned a tax, right? It's just, <laughs> it's just not something that's going to happen, right? People can complain, but you know, really, taxes are something that the federal government can easily do without really any oversight whatsoever. Also, along those lines, uh, pretty much all federal assistance—Medicare, Medicaid, disability, and maybe, maybe even federal retirement plans—will be cut for those people who resist. Um, again, this is something that could be easily done by the federal government because they are the one. The executive branch is what controls this stuff anyway, right? Um, so, yeah, that's that would I would not be surprised if that happened as well. Uh, also air travel, air travel is something that's easily, easily regulated because, you know, the FAA is federal, right? So, uh, you will not be able to get on a plane without that card, right? That already is happening in the, with the majority of airlines, right? We've, we've already have more tyrannical stuff happening with the airlines than with any other mode of transportation in the United States. So it would make absolutely perfect sense that you're not going to be able to travel anywhere without being, uh, jabbed. And in order to track all of this, there's going to be a database, right? 
Uh, we predicted this months ago, uh, but the federal regime is not going to be relying on a paper card for much longer. Uh, so again, we've talked quite a bit about this, but this is probably going to happen because right now there is almost zero way to detect forgeries, right? There is no database. Sure, a couple of states, I think like California and New York have actual databases, but they're state-based databases. Um, I might be wrong on that. I, I, I can't quite remember. But federally, there isn't a, a database to track who has been jabbed and who has not been jabbed. Of course, they're trying to track that. And the companies themselves are, are moving forward and trying to track that as well. But really, it's ineffective. So they can't really determine who's been jabbed and who hasn't uh, from a computer. They have to look at your physical card. Um, so this brings that, that guidance that I mentioned earlier, that WHO policy on digital passports, that, that kind of makes everything make a lot more sense now, right? And this digital federal database type stuff, or, or even before the digital means gets rolled out, um, this is going to manifest itself with uh, food control. Um, just like France and just like a lot of other European nations, Australia, right? You can't go to a grocery store unless you show your card, right? Um, this is probably going to be in the form of a federal mandate, which individual grocery stores will have to enforce on their own. Um, like I mentioned, France did this, Australia did this, and it would be very easy for the Biden regime to do. Now, as to how many people and companies would resist this, I don't know, Um Probably a lot more than even in France, uh, though. And of course, that's not including a, a state. You know, the conservative resistance states now uh, are going to come out with an opposing law that says, oh, by the way, it's illegal to do this. It's illegal to ask for somebody's, you know, like, and then it becomes a state's rights versus federal rights thing. And we, we know how that all shakes out, right? So I don't know how this is going to manifest itself, but I would I would bet this is going to happen very, very, very soon. And other things that people might not realize are things like vehicle registration. Um, so now we start realizing, okay, when the rubber meets the road, how is this enforcement going to go out, right? Now we understand why people like us have been concerned with things like automated license plate readers, right? It would be very easy to tie someone's um, medical status to their driver's license, which is in turn uh, tied to their vehicle registration. So... You drive by a, an automated license plate reader, and your uh, you know your license plate is flagged as being unclean, right? And there you go, you get pulled over, and you can't travel. So again, that might be a stretch right now, right? That's just you know, that sounds like some some truly dystopian stuff. But hey, I'm just I'm just throwing out some theories, right? And due to the colonial pipeline false flag attack, excuse me, cyber attack, the American people should have learned the value of stockpiling fuel, right? Because the federal government absolutely learned how access to fuel can cripple a society pretty much instantly. Again, something we're already seeing is medical care, right? Medical care will not be available to the unclean, right? Uh, this is already manifesting itself by doctors refusing to treat unjabbed patients. But it could get much worse. It could get as severe as you calling 911 for an emergency medical condition, for some kind of emergency, right? And they won't send an ambulance unless that person is jabbed. Um, it could manifest itself that way. Um, I don't know. But I'm just giving you, again, stuff that could happen. Also, coming back to travel, with more and more nations opening up around the world, the U.S. might even go so far as to revoke the passports of the unclean, right, so that we can't leave the country. Uh, again, this one might seem to be a bit extreme, but man, look at what's already happened. And revoking a passport is well within the capabilities of the executive branch. It's just a tiny tiptoe for the regime. And the regime has already made a gigantic leap into the illegal territory of telling people they can't work without the jab. So I would personally expect passports to be revoked uh, for people who are uh, un unstuck, right? Also, alternative currencies like you know Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies will most likely be banned very, very soon, as much as they can ban it. Um, that's definitely going to happen. I can say with oh, using our probabilistic language, I can say that that's almost certain. 
cryptocurrencies that cannot be tracked by governments are not acceptable to this regime. Um, so they're just going to ban it, again, as much as they can. The nature of crypto makes it hard to ban, but they have already strangled and manipulated the market to make it really difficult to exchange crypto for fiat currencies without being tracked. So that's going to continue as well. Like I remember when you could make a Coinbase account with no with nothing, and now you need freaking like tax documents to create a Coinbase account, right? You, like it's easier to file your taxes than it is to create a Coinbase account now. So stuff like that's going to continue. So I would personally expect like any entity that can be put in jail, right? Like somebody that you can actually grab, right? Like the developers of apps or the people who own domain names for cryptocurrency exchange sites, like that's, they're going to, to put pressure on those people. So yeah. We're also going to see a crackdown on the resistance, right? Everyone who disagrees with the Biden regime has already been branded a terrorist. That has already happened, Right. Though it is still rumored at this time, we're also seeing reports that the DHS, FBI, and Secret Service specifically launched an operation to surveil people who opposed Biden's remarks, right? Meaning that they knew people would resist to Biden announcing this, this mandate. So they collaborated ahead of time to catch anyone being stupid online and saying violent stuff so they could bag them that way. That's, that's actually really smart. We're actually really not that smart, but it does show that time and time again, it has been confirmed that the federal government entraps people. Whether it is a group of a dozen FBI agents that convince a handful of goobers to take over Michigan, or if it's a 15-year-old child with a, a mental disability, federal agencies' main job right now is to entrap people, just like history's oldest and most infamous secret police agencies. So please be smart about which outlet you choose to express yourself in because we do not live in the same world we used to anymore. Uh, rights have no bearing on our current situation. Uh, if you understand that there are now consequences for exercising our rights and you have taken steps to mitigate those negative consequences, that's good. But just remember, don't get complacent because these mandates are coming for everyone. Uh, based on how quickly we went from the military has to get it, now federal workers have to get it, and now anyone who works at a company with over 100 people has to get it. Not a lot of time has elapsed. We're talking like two weeks here has elapsed. We went to a full-scale textbook authoritarian dictatorship really dang quickly, uh, and we do not expect this speed to slow down anytime soon. So, as depressing as that is to end on, Let's just keep in mind to, to keep your chin up and be, be aware of this kind of stuff and start taking steps to mitigate your risks and prepare for basically having to live off grid, even though you're on the grid, because things like medical care, public utilities, uh, uh, property ownership, uh, food supplies, that's not going to be available to you in this new market system that they're creating. So moving forward into international issues, uh, there was, interestingly enough, there was a coup in Guinea, uh, which is right there on the map for those of you who don't know where that's at. A uh, small African nation, really not a whole lot goes on there. However, there is a lot of minerals, uh, specifically bauxite and aluminum. So this is something that's interesting to keep an eye on because... Basically, every nation in Africa has their own little mineral wealth that is very important to uh, the creation of other technological devices around the world, which is why dictatorships spring up in Africa so quickly. Uh, but this military coup, the, the short version of it is, is that the president was actually a dictator. Uh, he had changed their constitution to allow himself to remain in office and... Uh, the military special forces came in, deposed him, uh, kidnapped him. Uh, he's now under arrest and set up a military junta. So even though it kind of seems like these guys did the right thing by overthrowing their government, we'll see how it works out because these military juntas in Africa really, man, they, they really turn out to be some bad stuff at the end of the day. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a revolution in Africa work. Um, anyone that has succeeded has, has changed. So with the exception of maybe Tunisia. Tunisia has kind of escaped that uh, natural resource curse. Uh, but 
Moving on to France, uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, there was an incident of nuclear terrorism in France. Uh, there was, and this is, of course, all according to the French press and the French police, so take it with a grain of salt. But on August 26, a guy was arrested um, with significant amounts of uranium powder that he bought uh, online on eBay. Uh, and which he was planning to make a, uh, a nuclear device, either some kind of radiological device or a dirty bomb or, or something like that. It is unlikely that he would have been able to make a thermonuclear device, but um, with the amounts that I've seen have been disclosed that he had, there's no way he had enough, but it is interesting. Um, now, of course, the media is... Uh, was very quick, uh, the French media was very quick to point out that the police also found far-right extremism things like articles of clothing, uh, swastikas, things like that all around his apartment, his, his house, but um, I don't know if that's true or not, so, but it is kind of interesting that, hey, you know, these, these long-standing things that analysts have been looking out for, like nuclear terrorism, this, this old-school stuff, is definitely still, still an option for a lot of bad dudes around the planet, so... Very interesting to say the least. Also, China has proceeded with their Afghanistan development. They have um, they're creating their their new um, one road trade agreement, and that is uh, going to help out both China and Afghanistan. Uh, China is not doing uh, there. There's a lot of interesting things with regard to China economically. Like just the other day, they opened up their strategic oil reserves for the first time ever. So uh, that's not really something that a healthy economy does. Uh, so as much as we like to shout the China boogeyman um, sort of you know rhetoric, it is interesting to note to keep China in perspective when it comes to a military conflict. Like we, uh, you know, my personal opinion and really everybody else who works here, uh, our opinion is um, that China is, is going to be our next conflict. Uh, that's just something that we've come to expect. Now, how soon is that going to be? I don't know. And is it going to be a just conflict? I don't know that either, but I'm, I'm reading the writing on the wall, and our entire military seems to be preparing for that. And so the military-industrial complex will make it so if China doesn't make the first move at some point. So something to keep in mind, China is doing China things. Finally, before we end for the day, here is just another reminder to take a break every now and then. Uh, even for me, just reading my own slides today, I can feel my blood pressure rising. Uh, so just make sure to take care of yourself. Uh, yeah, things are going to get much, much worse. Uh, and we meant it when we said months ago that we were going to need smart, skilled, and dedicated people to help us get out of this mess when things really get bad. And we will have no chance at recovering from these problems if all of the smart and capable people have burned out long before then. So even if it seems like you have to be a little bit less informed or a little bit you know, behind the curve when it comes to the flow of information, it is worth it to put the smartphone down for a while and take a break. Uh, the world isn't going to end in a day, and even if it does, because it certainly seems like it is, uh, you won't be able to help anyone if you are so burned out from just reading what is going on in the world. So take a break, go outside, do something physical, and enjoy the freedom that we still have left while we still have it. And again, a special thank you to our supporters on Patreon and Teespring. I, I know we say it a lot, but your support is seriously helping us, uh, especially considering that we have all made some personal career choices lately. So again, thank you for helping us be able to continue the work we do, and we will keep on using our skills to help people out. So that's all we have for today, and we will see you next time. And as always, fight in the shade.